Hallelujah. Turn to Acts 27. I trust you like my uh, new T-shirt here. Uh, I'll let you t- have, have at least one guess. I don't think it'll take another guess to figure out who got it for me for Father's Day. Um, <laughs> she said she kept finding ones that said awesome like my daughter's. And he's like, she's like, I'm the only daughter. And I can't. And it wasn't until she actually ordered that she realized, oh, older, he's got two now. Oh, well, who cares? I, she, I guess she was understanding that she was the awesome one. So, uh, so Callie was just a bum. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, Acts 27. We got, we got, uh, we got Paul. He's, he's left Caesarea, went up to Sidon. Went across, went down into Crete, right? Went on the back side of, or north side of uh, Cyprus, went down to Crete, got caught up in Eurocladon, uh, and was just, they were just taken out to sea and were at the mercy of the storm for about 14 days. Uh, the men had, in essence, given up hope, and they were, they were frustrated. And again, you know, <clears throat> when the storm hangs out long enough, and I know we talked about it on the day that we, that, that we ministered this, um, but, uh, but hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so when, you're, when your hope goes on and then your, your, your hope goes on without an answer, it's really easy to lose that hope and to just think we're toast. And so they lost hope. Paul kind of got alone by himself with God. God came out and said, no, you're going to stand before Caesar. You're going to stand in Rome. Uh, but you're gonna have, and, and you're not gonna lose anybody on the ship. But you're gonna have to stop by an island first. Amen. Pit stop. Uh, so, so he he went up and encouraged encouraged them. Be of good cheer. Uh, you know, don't 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 be. Uh, you know, God's gonna protect us and, and take care of us. Um, and so that's where we kind of find ourselves. Well, then so so then they 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 start uh, hearing the splashing of waves that are unlike the splashing of waves that would be out in the middle of the ocean. It's, there, it's hitting something. And so they're aware that there's got to be land or rocks or something nearby. And so they're kind of getting excited, yet at the same time they know in the dark if they hit stone too quick, you know, just, you know, it, Titanic, you know, the Jack and Rose on the front of the boat, you know, on the, on the little door, whatever, uh, they're, they're in trouble. Uh, so they're hearing, they're hearing the sound. They, they, they check the depth. They realize they're getting more in shallower waters. So they drop the anchors in the in the back. While they're dropping the anchors in the back, all the sail salespeople that's not the right word, is it? Um, all the sail salesmen is that the word? Sailors? Okay, okay, all right. All the sailors, the salespeople, it's Diller, Dillard's employees are on the. Um, they, they go, they go. We're going to take care of the. Um, Anchors in the front of the ships. So you guys just go back there and work hard. And and while they're in the front of the ship, they're dropping the uh, uh, rowboat over the, the lifeboat over the side, and they're going to crawl down into it. And as they're getting ready to crawl overboard, um, the apostle Paul says, um, "You do that, you die." And it wasn't a threat; it was a promise. And and so they cut cut the strings and they let it go. Now, verse thirty three. That that brings us to verse thirty three here. And it says, and while it was, de- and while the day was coming on, because remember that happened in the dark, in about midnight, Paul besought them to take me, saying, "This day is the fourteenth day that we have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing, they haven't eaten in fourteen days. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not be a hair fallen from the head of any of you." And again, that doesn't mean that they're not going to lose, you know, that that. He's not literally taught. It's just it's that, it's that nothing's going to hurt you to the extreme that you're not even going to lose a hair, hair of head. It's just it's a proverb uh, that that we that they use on there. So it's it's not not I don't know that it necessarily be taken uh, literally uh, that nothing is you know not a hair is going to fall because hair falls for some of us on a daily basis. Uh, you know, uh, husbands, you know you know how hair falls in the shower. And your wife's done, swirled on the wall. I mean, anyway, anyway, that's that's another point. Uh, so so we lose. So that's but but what the point is? It's a figure of speech saying that you, no harm's going to come to any of you at all. Verse thirty-five. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, gave thanks uh, thanks to God in the presence of them all, 
and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Uh, then they were all of good cheer. Remember, they had told him to be a good cheer, and now they were all in a good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were all in the ship, 200 and uh, uh, 200, three score and 16 souls. I think that's 276 if my math is correct for those that have different translations of the Bible. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, cast out the wheat into the sea. So in other words, all the extra food that they had to eat that they weren't eating, they no longer needed because they're getting close to the land. And now we want to make the ship as light as possible to float on top. So, so, so they've been in the mess of a storm for a long time. Uh, specifically, they're Eurocladon for 14 days. They've been in contrary winds for over that. And so, I mean, it could have been up to, it could have been up to close to a month, but probably in the vicinity of 21 days, they've been just fighting this wind nonstop. I remember when we were down in Texas and my dad would go down, we were very, we were at the very point of Texas and right on the Gulf, uh, we were a half hour from South Padre Island Beach. And um, if we'd have known then, our love for beaches it would have been a lot nicer. Um, but, uh, but we were right there. So the wind off the Gulf, have you ever been to a beach? It's always somewhat windy. Uh, I mean, it, sometimes it's not real windy, but there's always some kind of wind. Well, if you live there, you find out that it's windier a lot more than you think it is. So my dad would come down there, and anybody that knows my, uh, uh, knew my dad back then with his hair. Remember, I don't know how many of you remember his hair that was like a visor straight across, and he didn't want it. And so when we'd go golfing or we'd, go, we'd do something, we'd walk, we'd walk into a, a, a store of some sort or um, he'd, he'd step out and we'd have that strong breeze and he'd just, and his hair would go whoop straight up, straight up and down instead of laying down. Uh, and, and, uh, and he would, he was so annoyed with the wind and the, and when we go golfing and the wind was constantly blowing when we're out there and he'd be like, hey, does the wind ever stop? And I'm like, yeah, so, like sometimes right in the middle of the afternoon when it's 95 or hundred degrees out, it stops. And that's when you're banging for it. Um, <laughs> but, but. But can you imagine being in this in this fierce wind, this contrary wind constantly trying to do your job and it's keeping you from doing your job and the job that should have taken uh, should have taken a, a, a couple days to, to take care of. You're 21 days into the journey and you've been fighting it and it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. I, I, mean, I, I want you to see this, that, that this is what they've been up for for a long time. Verse 20 says they'd already lost hope. And we know that Paul had been encouraged them, but here's what happened. They've been fighting the wind, so they were tired of fighting the wind. They've been constantly bailing water. Not only have they been bailing water, but they've been throwing things overboard. They were constantly in work mode, trying to do stuff. When they weren't in work mode, they were, uh, they were in depression mode. Amen. And so here they are, they're sensing that... that uh, that, that land is coming up, and so the so us are we're thinking, oh praise God, close land. No, they're sailors. They know that we're still out of control. We're still going hard, and if we go hard into rocks that usually are around a coral, or that are around the uh, around uh, the the shore of of an island, it'll rip this thing in half. And when it rips this thing in half, we're gonna we're hitting the water and all that kind of stuff. We could be in serious trouble. Uh, and so now they're working hard, dropping anchor, you know, and doing everything to prepare to slow themselves down. So again, this is, is time after time dealing with the contrary winds, dealing with the storm. And I, I, again, I want that to, I, I want I want us to get that inside of us. That chapter 27, the first the first message I preached on chapter 27 back, I think it was in March. Um, we brought out the point that this is about dealing with the storms of life. And if we will look at it as that, we will we will understand what we need to do in the middle of the storm in order to stand strong and to make it out of the storm. And, and, and so it, we see here, expect favor, listen to wisdom, stay in covenant, uh, let nothing be your master. In other words, you tell money what to do. You tell your time what to do. You tell, uh, you know, you tell, you tell things what to do. Don't you make them, don't be their master. Don't be their servant. Be a servant to nothing. 
what is it? Uh, Zach Williams has a song, I'm a slave to nothing. And that, and that's, that has got to be our, our mentality. Things serve us. We don't serve them. We serve God. Uh, strengthen yourself. Throw away all weights that entangle you. Don't give up hope. We went through things that, that they did, uh, that did after giving, after they were giving up hope. Don't jump ship. Spent two weeks talking about that. I trust that you're grabbing a hold of that point of it. Don't jump ship. Um, well, today I, we, we get into the next thing that I think that, that when you're in the middle of the storm, if you're not doing this, then you will get in terms of what we understand nowadays as hangry. We, we know what hangry is. It's, it's hungry and angry. In other words, you're so hungry that everything everybody else does annoys you and you get mad at them real easy. Now, what that is technically is that you are so frustrated, you are so, you are so annoyed, you are so overcome by the struggles, the, the battles of life, that your emotions are out of control. Your soul is out of control. Your, your, your emotions, your, your, your thinker, your feeler, your chooser, they're out of control. And, and your, or, or, your flesh, or your flesh is out of control. In other words, your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions is making decisions based on your flesh. It's out of control. Now, again, I'm not, we're not going to get into this, but we understand that you are directed either by your flesh, carnal, Romans chapter 8, your carnal, or your, or your spirit man. You're, you're led by one of those two. And when your flesh is out of control, when your flesh is hungry, your flesh is weak, when your flesh is not, it is not in control, or when your spirit's weak, when your flesh is hang, angry and, and strong, it will have you make decisions you wouldn't have made it otherwise. It'll make you, it'll, it'll make you, uh, your, 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 your emotions will drive you. Are you with me here? Uh, your, your anger will go crazy. Your depression will go crazy. Your uh, frustration will go crazy. Every emotion that you could imagine uh, will, 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 will drive you up the wall because it will be in control of your life. And that's what's literally happening here is, is that they are physically tired, haven't slept, they've been working, they've been unloading the ship, they've been, they've been bailing water. They are mentally tired. The anguish of not seeing their, their, their families again. The anguish of, of dying. Right? The anguish of losing the ship. It, it's got them, it, they, they are mentally tired. And most of all, they're physically exhausted. They haven't eaten in 14 days. I was telling Jessica when she came to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my, I'm trying to just try to control what I eat and eat not as, not as much. And, and, and I, I was doing great today and then I got home and then I had this, <laughs> I just kept thinking, I just need something to eat. I just need something to eat. And I mean, that was what, eight hours or, or, or six hours since I ate breakfast. And I, I was like, I need something else. A couple hours since I had lunch. I just need something else. These guys hadn't eaten in 14 days. So not only were they weak, but they were hangry. Their emotions were, were taken over. So what Paul says here is that we need to eat. Um, he, he says, uh, um, you, you've not eaten. You've taken in nothing. You need to eat. Um, I already said. Uh, and, so, and so that's what he, he begins directing them to do. And again, it's just barely light outside. Um, but... Uh, but that's what he directs them to do. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to get into what we're talking about here tonight. Um, the Holy Spirit directed me on. Hallelujah. Summer showed up a couple days early, didn't it? Goodness gracious. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read this in verse 1. Um, start, start reading in verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual but as to carnal. Now, real quick here, and we're not, we're not going to look at it, but we know our circle of victory. We know the carnal side is our flesh side. Uh, and I just talked about that. When that is going strong, when that's, go, when that's being fed only, um, 
your spirit man is weak. And so he said, I can't, te I can't teach you as someone who is strong in the spirit realm. I can uh, uh, only deal with your carnality. I'm trying to get you to quit doing fleshly stuff. Stuff that you should already know not to be, not to be doing. Because your flesh is, is running rampant. Uh, specifically in verse 3, I, I, it, it talks about uh, uh, divisions and strifes. And, and they're, they're not getting along with one another. And they're, I'm in Paul's camp. I'm in Apollo's camp. And they're, and they're fighting against one another. And he said, I can't even talk to you. In the, I can't even build you up in the spirit realm because you're all acting so carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto we were not, you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. And again, if you go on to verse 3 right there, it just simply shows that uh, you're carnal because you're envy and strife and divisions and you walk as mere men and things on that order. So, so, so it, it, they're, they're, they have fed their flesh so much that their flesh is strong. And, 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 and when your flesh is strong, you'll do fleshly things a lot. It'll be really easy to get annoyed with people. Have you, have you ever found yourself like that? You go to the store and it's just so much so easy just to get annoyed. And they don't have to do that much. They don't have there's, there's people that you that, that literally everybody in the store would be annoyed at. And, but there's people that just do the minor things. And you just like, you need to be slapped upside the head. Well, beloved, that's not, that, that's not happening. You're not saying that because your spirit man is so strong. You're saying that because your flesh man is, is, is real strong. I get it. I mean, I get it. And so he said, because your flesh man is so strong, I can't get into the deeper things of God, which is the meat of the word of God. I can only teach you stuff like thou shalt not. You know what? There's not a whole lot of reason uh, to deal with the thou shalt not if the body of Christ would just get the, the, the first commandment, the, the main commandment of love down. If we're loving God and loving man. There's no reason for us to sit there and go through the Ten Commandments because those two commandments knock out all the other ten. Make, make, them obsolete, make those words obsolete because now we love man enough to, to not envy, not strive, not, not divide ourselves amongst them. Amen. Um, so, so, uh, what, so what God wants to happen is for us to be fed with the meat. Now, you say, what's the meat? Well, the meat's the Word of God. It's the depth of the Word of God. God doesn't want us just learning the basics of getting along with one another. You know, that's the one thing that, I, I, that it never ceases to amaze me. If there's anything, anything Christian on TikTok or Reels or anything like that, anybody saying anything about anything, either what they're saying is divisive or what they say that is Sweet, like honey, everybody's fighting in the comments section. I'm like, it's no wonder nothing's getting done in the kingdom of God right now. It's because very few Christians are actually strong enough to fight against the devil. They're worn out because all they're doing is swigging a milk every day and can't figure out why their muscles aren't getting bigger. You find someone whose muscles are getting bigger. You'll find someone who uh, um, who might drink some milk, but he's got some meat in his diet. He's got some protein in his diet, and that's what God says. He says, if you are not, um, if you're in the middle of the storm and all you're doing is swigging a little bit of milk every now and then, you will be too weak to stand. In the middle of the storms. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. How can you stand if you have no strength? You've got to get fed. You've got to get, uh, got to get the meat. Uh, go to John chapter 4. I, I, I literally scratched a few things on a 
piece of paper. And then when I was done typing, um, I was four pages into notes. And, and, uh, and I was like, well, I'm going to have to move uh, to, get, to get this done tonight. But we can do it. Uh, because I believe that when we're dealing with the Word, that we even go deeper than just hearing the Word. Um, John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, My meat, huh, my meat is to, to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I'm going to read that in a couple more translations. The NASB says, and Jesus said unto them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. It's my food. It's what I eat. It's what, it's what sustains me. It's what strengthens me. It's not just to hear what my Father says, but to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. The New Living Translation, and I just it adds a different spice to it, uh, Jesus explained my nourishment, my, 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 I can almost hear him, in, in the terms of a weightlifter, my supplement. The thing that I do to, to increase me stronger and increase me quicker is to, uh, is to do the will of God who sent me and to, and to finish his work. The th- Beloved, I, I, I give to you and I, I, I submit to you that, that, um, that the meat that we are supposed to eat in life is not just the obedience, just not the, the the understanding and knowing what the word of God says, but to do what he says. Jesus said, My meat is not just to hear his word, but to do his word. And so when Paul is looking at these men saying, in the middle of this storm, you need to need to get some meat. It's a picture to us that in the middle, what do we do in the middle of the storm? Get, stay in the word, get in the word, stay in the word, and obey the word. All right. So here I am. I'm, I'm studying this thing. I've got all these things, and I'm, I'm typing it up, and all of a sudden I pause because I start thinking about a dude that I like to, I like to preach on. Uh, actually, I like preaching on his daddy, uh, but prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. And, and this, this hit me so strong. Because I was thinking about this a couple days ago. Why did the prodigal son leave home? We don't really know. We know that he asked for his inheritance. His dad gave him his inheritance, gave his brother his inheritance. But why did he leave home? And, um, I mean, we, we tap into a little bit of it. A couple of chapter, uh, verses later where he says that he spent it all on righteous living. And the Holy Spirit kind of dropped in my heart. He said, he said, he said, the reason he left home is because he wanted what dad had without doing what dad said. He wanted what dad had. He wanted the blessing of dad. He wanted, the, he wanted the, uh, all of dad's goods, but he didn't want to have to live under dad's covering and, and rules. And so when, dad, when, when, he, when he took his stuff and left, he now had dad's stuff, and he didn't have to obey that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But here's, here's the thing. When he left home... He got hit with a storm. I, I, I like this one because we're right. I, what, well, everybody has, everybody thinks they're blessed until they get hit with famine. You know, he was spending, having a good time. Then famine hit the land. His money ran out. And look, look. Well, I'm not going to look at the scripture here. You know, this. He would have feigned if he could, if he could have eaten what the pigs ate. He, in other words, he was planning and he. He was like, I need to eat what the pigs are eating. What do pigs eat? Do they eat meat? No, no, they eat garbage. They eat co- cobs and they eat that kind of stuff. They, they eat leftover. They're, they're, they're not necessarily known for, uh, for eating the meat. Maybe they eat some, I don't know, but, uh, but they're not known for that. So what he was wanting, he was wanting the corn cobs that went out there just to, uh, to chew on it for a while, to get something in his, in his belly nourishment. 
because he was now out of under out of under dad's covering, not submissive to his dad's will. He went home, and we know this well. He he went home back to his dad, and guess what? The thing he got when he got under his dad's roof. What was the first thing? Would they kill? Yeah, they didn't. They didn't go cut down the stalk of corn. They killed the fatted calf and gave him meat. Everybody thinks you get by with stuff until you get hit with a storm, with famine. But when you get hit with storm and you're not with a storm, or you're in the middle of famine and you lack meat, you will get weak. You will faint. You will stop short. But when you are in a place of growth, in a place of, of safety, in a place where uh, where famine don't matter, it means that you are in a place consuming his meat. Go, 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 go to Hebrews chapter 5. Consuming that meat, that word, obeying what dad, now he's in debt. Remember, he came back with a, with a, with a changed attitude. Uh, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. And he goes, okay, now I can work inside that. You are not my servant. You are my son. Now come and eat meat and take your spot. You cannot take your spot if you're not going to eat meat. Beloved, we cannot do what we need to do in the kingdom of God. We cannot operate the way God wants us to operate if we are, if we are, if we are weak and if we are not feasting on his word and obeying what his word tells us to do. If we're doing it our own ways, if we want his blessings without operating in his in his in his truth, if we want listen, folks, I I I've been in this thing long enough to know people think that well, I've gotten by with it so far, so I can just keep disobeying. No, you can't. Because there will come a time where famine will hit you. All right, but are you in Hebrews 5? Verse 11, very similar here. It says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of, of hearing. Talking to them, he's like, man, we, we, we had so much to give to you, but you were not listening to what we had to say. Verse 12, for when, for when, good old King James Version, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers you have need that one teach you, teach you again, um, uh, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such that have need of milk and not of meat. You're, forget, about, forget about listening to the voice of the Spirit. Forget about being led by the Spirit. Forget about that stuff. You have to, you have to sit there and, and just and be taught again. Don't... don't <laughs> At least, Pastor Lisa's not here. Don't bring your skillet out. You have to be taught again not, uh, not to, to compare, to not strive, to not. Uh, you, you've got to go back to that point again, all over again, because you hear the word, the word, uh, what is it, Yangi Cho? Um, some, somebody uh, he, he, uh, came up to him and said, uh, said, I was reading a book or something like that, and I, I heard this, and and I don't know why you don't preach on it. And Yangi Cho said, I preach. You sleep while I preach. You know, and, and, that, and, that's, and, and there's a lot of people that, well, there's sometimes people sleep, but there's sometimes people aren't sleeping with their eyes closed. They're sleeping with their hearts closed. And then they can't figure out why think, why the storm's still raging. Why am I weak? Why am I, why is the storm overtaking me? Why, why, why do... Why can I get not get why can I not get victory over this area of my life? Why can't I do it? It's because you're weak. You're not listening. You don't and I, I like you know verse 13 says for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. You don't know who you are. You're wanting the blessing without the obedience. And, and again, I, I love the picture of both those brothers because one of the brothers 
had the obedience without the blessing. And he's the least talk about character in that story, his brother. And I think he's one of the most important ones. Because he had all the obedience, he had all the I, I shall do's, but, but he did not understand who he was. He didn't understand his righteousness. The other son knew what was his, but he didn't want to obey. What did the father need them both to do? Find that place where they, where they know who they are and they obey, they yield because of the love of the father and the love of what he has and the love of what they've done, uh, what he's done for them. Amen. Romans, go, go to Romans 8, verse 14. Kind of balance out everything here that we've been talking about with this flesh and the spirit and, 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 and living by the spirit and hearing, hearing the Father and obeying him. Uh, but in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as, that are, that are, as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the huios of God. And remember the, the, the difference between technon, which is in chapter 6, where it says you, you're kids of God. You, you, there's a difference between a biological kid and someone who's ready to, to have what's been promised them. Jessica absolutely loves Phoenix, and we know she loves Phoenix. She's so proud of Phoenix. You can't even you can't look at Facebook without knowing how much she loves Phoenix. But she would not give Phoenix the keys to the car. She'd find it ran into something down the block and in the yard, in the garage, without the garage door open or open. You don't give you don't give things to kids that are not ready to receive it. And if you, are, if you have learned to be led by the Spirit, to walk with Him, to fellowship with Him, to hear what He has to say, and then do it, what if it's hard? Oh, it's, it'll probably be hard. Because the just shall live by faith. What if it's bigger than what I've, what, anything I've done before? It possibly will be bigger than anything you've done before. But if you're out of practice of listening and doing, It'll be even harder. When you are not on the meat of the word, you cannot be trusted with greater. When, when, um, when I was a kid, I can't remember what age I was when we moved into the house on Parkway Drive. I've told you about it before, but the front yard was three tiers. It, it came from the sidewalk and came, kind of came up, I'd say about 10 feet. And then at 10 feet, there was a brick wall that would go about right here. It was awesome because remember the days of uh, Battle of the Network Stars? Where they had the obstacle courses. My friends and I would run obstacle courses around our yard because we had – we had these rock ledges that we'd climb, and it was like we were run, run up that rope wall, you know. And, and so we go up there, we get there, and it, it'd be there. Now, this was the first one you could go around the edge, and there, you had about three feet between the next yard, and so you could take that ledge up. And so that was the second one. So now the second one's up there. But the thing was is that you had to run the push mower right along the edge, well, often hanging over two wheels on there. So, Dad, you're not going to give that to a person that's not strong. So there would have been a time in my life my dad would have had to do it. He's not going to put that, that responsibility into my hands if I'm not strong enough to make sure that is up there. Now, th th then you go another 10 or 12 feet, and there was another walk, rock wall that went up to the, the level of our house. And, um, and up there it had two – it had, had, a, had I don't know why it had steps there because there was no – Nobody is going to walk and climb brick to get up there anyway. So that there was there was a staircase, and then on each side there was grass. So I had to pull it up there to the top part and then start it up and to mow those little patches of grass. 
And then I'd go to the backyard, go to the side. And then in the backyard, it was, it was a big, it, was not, it had trees in there, but it was this open lot. I'd, and then, then right, okay, we got the front of the house. Then right over here was our, 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 our uh, um, driveway. And then right on the other side of the driveway, there was about a, on one part, it was probably eight foot because it was quite a bit over my head, about an eight foot rock wall. And it would, it would kind of come down like this until at the corner was about a six foot rock wall. And then it turned the corner, and so it was all boarded all the way to the back of our property until it was about three feet rock wall, two feet rock wall in the very back. And so when I was mowing the backyard, I had to go right up against that eight foot rock wall, and walk. And then there was a there, we had a tree right in the corner of it, and it was unruly, and so it would stick way out. So I had to lean over. If you can imagine, right here's the 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 edge of the rock wall, eight feet down, and I'm I'm pushing that lawnmower. As far as I can get it up that way, I didn't like this side because it was eight foot. I go over this side where it's only five foot drop because if I if I had to if I had to bail and jump off of this one, it was less likely I get hurt. I get on this side and I go around there. You don't give that responsibility to somebody who's not strong. God has called each and every one of us to a gifting. He has called us to his blessings. He has called us to more than enough. He has called us to fulfill a gifting and a calling that he has placed on us. And there's a lot of us really struggling because why are we not further along in it? The, the answer must be, are, what are you feeding on? How strong are you really? Are you strong enough to, to, to handle uh, what, what God's giving you? I want to be a pastor. Do you really want to be a pastor? I could tell you some stories. It's easy to be a pastor. Is it easy to be a pastor? I could tell you some stories. Our number one goal in the storm is to keep eating. Is to keep feeding on the word. Don't stop feeding on the word. When the storm gets really tough, the temptation, stop. But that would be the worst mistake he ever made. Now you say, how do I, how do I feed on the meat of the word? Well, let me give you five quick things here. I'm not, I'm not going to get details on this outside of just run through it. First of all, ask for the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit's been given to us. John chapter 14 says that he has given us a comforter. John 14, 26. It says, but the Comforter, which is, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father has sent in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said to you. So when you get ready to read the Bible, when you get ready to listen to a sermon, come into church. Pastor Thad's ready to preach. And you're sitting there going, um, let me catch up on my correspondence. Got some texts, got some emails. Let me catch up on my social media. And, and, and that's your, you have not come re uh, ready with the Holy Spirit. But that's why we do a lot of worshiping, uh, is because we need to get our hearts ready to receive. But if you're at home, if you're driving your car and, and, and you've got, you're ready to turn on a Bill Johnson, you're ready to turn on a Rick Renner, you're ready to turn on a Thad Callahan uh, sermon, and you're, you're ready to turn that on, don't just turn it on. Let the Spirit of God say, Holy Spirit, give me insight. You said, ask, if I lack anything, ask in your name, and I need insight. There was a day, it was, I think it was that day that I was sitting around with, uh, um, with the, when the, air con or the heat bill was so high back in 2013, I think it was, um, maybe 2014, and, and I was sitting there, and I, all I could think of, I was overwhelmed by it, and all I could think of was the Holy Spirit. I just I felt, got to turn something on. Got to turn something on to turn me on. So I went, and the first thing I opened up, I, there was a, it was a, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I, th I feel like it was um, the, the Copeland's, the Southwest Believers Conference. Uh, it was right there, and I opened it up. And the first thing I saw was a Jesse Duplantis, and I thought, well, at least he's funny. And I hit it, and he starts talking about God saying, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. If you can believe for it, I'll pay for it. 
and he he was going through these, and I'm, I'm, I stopped everything and just started writing these things down. I still have a copy of that in, in my desk that I of, of things I wrote down because it it lit me up that day. So I say, God, Holy Spirit, light me up. Give me the wisdom, the revelation I need. If I'm going to read a couple verses, of, if I'm going to read some, some from the Bible, Lord, let this come alive in me. If you, for number two, if you're going to read in, the, in Scripture or read even a book, try not to necessarily read huge chunks. Don't go for finishing a chapter or a book. Read. You've, you've already told the Holy Spirit, open my eyes, Right? So now begin reading to understand. Find NASB, NTL, uh, Amplified, whatever, Passion. I don't care what you find. Find a, find a version you like and read something at a, in, at a pace and, and, and a chunk that, that will minister to you. If it takes you uh, 13 years uh, to get... Uh, was it 2015? So it's taken nine years. If it takes you 10 years to get through a book of the Bible, you're not the first. If it takes you 13 years to get through a book, but just take it and feed on it, pray on it, speak in tongues over it. Do what do what the uh, the, the next one is is read 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 bite sized portions, but then meditate on it. number three, meditate on it. Meditate on a day and night is what Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says. Uh, Psalms 119, where all it talks about is the word of God. It says things like this, verse 15, I will med meditate on thy precepts. Verse 16, I will delight myself, in you. I will not forget your word. Verse 23, uh, um, but thy servant meditates in thy statutes. Verse 27, uh, make me to understand the way of your precepts. Verse 48, um, I will meditate in thy statutes. Verse 78, and I will meditate in the pre your precepts. Uh, verse 97, um, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Verse 99, um, I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy, my testimonies are my meditation. So when we're dealing in that testimonies is, is yes, it could be construed as our, as what we get. But that testimony is literally another of the covenants of God that he has shared with me. That's my meditation. I meditate. I don't meditate on all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and, and so we meditate day and night. We think about those little bite-sized chunks throughout the day. And, and that's number four is take it, through, take it with you through the day. Don't just leave it in your car. Don't just leave it. Let it be something you write down on a piece of paper and take with you during the day. Meditate in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 means to bring it up like a, like a cow brings up cud. He'll, he'll swallow it and a little while later it only goes to his first stomach. He'll regurgitate it, chew on it some more to make sure he gets all the nutrients out of it. Well, that's exactly what we're wanting to do with the word of God. Keep it going in your mind day and night constantly. Bring it up, bring it up again, bring it up again. And number five, Obey what you see. Again, back in Psalm 119, verse, verse 60, I made haste and delayed not in keeping the commandments. Verse 67, be, uh, before I was afflicted, I went astray, and now I have kept thy word. In other words, when I, when I went astray, I was afflicted, I kept his word, and now I'm not. Do you want to walk in the victory over the storm? Then you're going to need the meat. And if I can just throw this at you, go, go back to um, Acts 27. And, and this again, this is going to be real quick here because I just want you to, uh, I, I want to get this point in you that we, it's not just about the, 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 the taking the word in, but the doing the word. And again, think about it. If if uh, if Pastor Lisa, you know, this summer and she makes this big, huge meal, and Neil comes home from 
uh, from working or whatever, you know, from Mount Strong, we're doing whatever. And he comes in and it's, and it's sitting there and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ribeye and it's, it's, it's perfection just right inside, right outside potatoes, all this stuff. And, 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 and Neil gets down and goes, it's delicious. And then goes to sit and sits in his recliner and falls asleep. Didn't take enough just to enjoy what it was. It looks beautiful, hon. Thank you. And then goes take a shower and then, you know, goes and watch TV. If it doesn't get in you to where it begins working in you and working, then it was, it was, it's not going to do you any good. So what, what happens when you get the meat in you? You're in 27. Go to 35. And then I know this is what Paul does, but Paul says it and they all heard him. And Paul, when you get the meat, you focus on thanks. Grat your gratitude increases. Paul gave thanks. And I know it says he gave thanks to the food like you would do, but but again, I just couldn't I couldn't pass that up. If you get the meat in you, your gratitude will be greater than your griping. I got a lot of good one liners here tonight. I needed somebody to write them all down. Number two, verse 36. What did they all do? They all cheered up. When you get the word in you, your joy will increase. And, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. So number three, and this is in verse 38, they began, here's men that haven't eaten in, in 14 days. They, they're early in the, the journey. They were throwing things overboard. It doesn't say they were doing a whole lot of it. They, they threw the anchors over. But now they've eaten, and all of a sudden they've got strength to be again throwing, lightening the ship again. So the third thing that it will do when you get that word in you, not just in you, but get it working, is it'll strengthen you. And number four, breakthroughs near. I love that. I, I almost missed this part. I didn't have this written down. And the very last thing, I, I just I looked. I looked and I just saw, I read through it one more time and I thought, hold it, thanks, joy, strength, breakthrough. Now the breakthrough didn't look like they thought the breakthrough would look like. A lot of us think that the ship's going to cruise right up onto the beach and you're going to get out in your flip-flops and sandals and, and swim trunks and lay on the beach and look really good. I mean, their, their breakthrough was that, that uh, daylight came Land showed up. They had to swim a little bit, but they, but their lives were. A lot of people want breakthrough. They don't want the meat that will bring them to it. God wants us to have the meat. He is not just after us having this unicorns and rainbow life. He, I believe he wants us to have a good life, enjoy life. That's, I, I don't believe, I don't, but he wants us more to know who he is, know who we are, so that we can live in his house and operate under his system, eat his meat, and succeed. But if you're doing it your own way, you'll always stop short. Let's stand together. You know, one other thing I, I have written down here that I, I'll just kind of throw out here. You know the main cook? I know the Holy Spirit. Don't say the Holy Spirit. But you know the main cook, main chef for the word that God wants to have in you? You know who that is? Uh, maybe I heard someone say. Come on. No. Me. Holy Spirit gives me the recipes and I deliver them to you. And I know, you know, but you think highlight. No, I'm not. That's why he gives you fivefold ministry. That's why he gives you pastors, preachers for the edifying saints, for the working ministry, to get you strengthened up. Yes, the Holy Spirit, I get that. The pastor can only release the words, the Holy Spirit quickens it in you. But the main feeder is your pastor, your fivefold ministry gives. And I thought about this, and this was one, this is one of the things. I'd heard people sometimes say, sometimes because of the old covenant, 
when the, in the tabernacle, the, all the different people would bring their tithes to the priests that worked the ministry, and then the priests would give to the high priest. And 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 so I've heard people use that as as the reason why people should tithe to the pastors. And you all know you all know me well enough that I've said that's that doesn't fit because we're all priests and kings, so that 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 doesn't fit on that. But this one in Malachi, where it says, bring all the tithe to the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And again, not, not even doing anything else. I thought, you know, a lot of times when we fight with the, why do we do the tithe thing? So that there's meat. So that you're not getting some just, you know, I, I know way too many pastors who, because they worked all day on Wednesday, they're coming and they're just giving you a little bit of word, a little bit of something, a little taste of something that they, that they thought of at work today. Or they don't have Wednesday night services. Or they've worked hard all week and they had family things on, on Saturday, so they come in on Sunday and they got something a little bit for you. But God said, I want you to bring your tithe into the storehouse so that the men of God that I have put, appointed to feed you has the time to actually feed you instead of... Amen. I, th I thought that was interesting. The reason we tithe is that there's, there's meat. There's word in the house. Who gives the word? The man of God, the man or woman of God. Amen. All right. So, so it just an encouragement to you. In the storm, don't step away from the don't step away from the word. Step into it and, and, and stay faithful to it. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a light into our path, uh, that it is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, that it leads us. In dark times, it leads us in the storms. But, but Heavenly Father, if we, will, if we will use it, we will walk in it, it will strengthen us to overcome everything the enemy brings in our path. And it will bring us to breakthrough in our lives. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word. Now let us activate it in our lives. In Jesus' name.